Welcome to all our attendees. I see 23 participants right now. Um, we'll have a panel discussion first, as usual with our workshops. And then after, by, after about 45 minutes to an hour, we'll answer questions um, from our viewers. So please submit your questions in the chat field. I think you could also use Q&A, but I, I believe that usually, if I'm not mistaken, Rebecca, we usually use the chat field for questions. Right, right. Yeah. So glad to have you on this overcast Saturday morning. I hope uh, everyone was safe last night. I know it was, we had to deal with a lot of inclement weather and it was windy, very windy and rainy. So hope everybody's okay. Yes. We'll give it a few more minutes and then um, I'll just have a few words and then I'll turn it over to our um, <coughs> workshop board member and workshop committee co-chair, Erica Maldonado, who will introduce the panel. So, and for those of you who are new to Natta Chicago Midwest, you definitely want to visit our website on a regular basis, the chicagoemeonline.org, and that's where we have information about all the workshops. We're, we have an ambitious workshop schedule this year with at least one event every month, and usually it ends up being a little more than that, but planned, we have one a month, and then we have partnerships with our other chapters and we, they, they also have interesting workshops and we'll offer them to our members as well. So um, definitely um, look at um, our website, chicagoemeonline.org for information about future workshops. We also have a junior board that we elected last year. Um, they comprise of students ages 18 to 26, students and young professionals. Um, and they are producing a really great podcast, a weekly podcast called The Pursuit. And the idea behind this podcast, it's a weekly series where um, members of our junior board interview established members of the broadcast um, community in Chicago and throughout the other um, um, markets in our chapters to get information about how to get started and, 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 and why, why um, what, what creates success in the broadcast industry. So you, you definitely wanna listen to these pro, uh, podcasts. They're about an hour long. So again, uh, they're available on our website, chicagoemeonline.org, along with other, it's also available on other um, platforms, podcast platforms. And then finally, just wanted to alert you to our uh, Education and Scholarship Foundation, the Natish Chicago Foundation. Um, we do have deadlines coming up for high school and college scholarships. The um, uh, high school deadline, is, or the college uh, scholarship deadline is February 18th, and then the high school scholarship deadline is March 18th, and again, all the information's on our website, chicagoemeonline.org, so you definitely wanna visit our website for information about that. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our, uh, 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 my fellow board member, Erica Maldonado, and she'll introduce our panel. So Erica, take it away. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so very much for being with us this windy, very windy morning. <laughs> I hope, as John, that everybody is safe, and thank you for being um, with us. I hope this session is uh, informative, and we can have a robust discussion about um, directing and what's the future of this industry, how it has it changed. And um, I would like to introduce now our MC. I'm very grateful that he agreed to uh, be our master of ceremony today. His name is Jose Aguilar. Please, Jose, raise your hand so everybody knows you. <laughs> okay, that's Jose Aguilar. He's a filmmaker. He's a journalist based in Chicago. Jose is an Emmy-nominated director, and he has been directing, even though he looks so young, 
for seven years now and has been the recipient of two very uh, coveted awards at the Stud Circle Award and the Peter Lisa Award. Jose uh, right now is a freelancer with NBC5 Telemundo Chicago. So thank you so very much, Jose, for being with us. And uh, please introduce our, our great panel. And I'm very thank you, uh, thankful to all of you guys for participating this morning. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I am super excited to be in this panel or and be with you guys because I've grown to love directing so much and I've appreciated the art so much that I like to learn and pick information from everybody. And I think this would be a great gateway for that for people trying to get in the business. But with that, let me first start off by introducing everybody. Uh, we have Berta Serrano, who is a current director at Fox 32. You can raise your hand. I'm not sure if they can see you. Uh, we have Kevin Dussault, which I think he's going to join us later. Uh, he's the director of Marquee Sports. We have Steve Novak, director of WGN. And then we have Javier Pacheco, director at NBC5 Telemundo Chicago. So I'm going to take the title of this uh, panel and start off with the past. And if I could just briefly have everyone talk about uh, their childhood, one where you're from, to showcase the diversity of where uh, different people can come from and do what we're doing. But two, also, did you did you guys have that interest of production, directing, or whatever this industry is or where we're, we're a part of from back then? Uh, so we'll start off with ladies first. So Bertha, if you could go on and answer the question. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bertha Serrano, or Betty. I am from Mexico. I was born in Zacatecas, Mexico, and I've been in, well, in the Chicago area since I was three. Growing up, I wanted to be a teacher, and then I just kept changing my mind, so that kind of influenced where I ended up, uh, what I ended up doing for college. Eventually, I ended up at Columbia College, where I studied print journalism, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was graduating in 2009. The economy wasn't in its best as, as it had been. And I was just very fortunate that I applied for a freelance position and I was able to learn so much at the at Univision Chicago where I started. So growing up, it was amazing because I had, you know, grown up watching Jorge Barbosa and all those, uh, Hector Rosano and all those people that, was like an influence because we would watch TV at home every single day. We would watch the newscast. So then when I started working at Univision, it was just amazing to like, you know, be in the lunchroom with them and like, you know, have a conversation with them. So that was really neat. But no, production was not a part of my life until I actually joined Univision in 2009. Got it. So. Oh, yeah. And I think that's important because a lot of people have this notion that it's been there from the beginning, but it's good to hear that you've been, you had to change your majors. So thank you very much. Now, Steve, what about you? Well, I was born and raised in Chicago. Uh, I've been at WGN off and on for 42 years. Uh, started directing at age 23, uh, doing news. I do sports. Uh, I did sports. I do news, community affairs specials. I produce and direct a lot of different shows. I caught the bug in college. Uh, I didn't know what I was wanted to do. And I took a class in college called Introduction to Radio, Television, and Film. And I found a professor there that really piqued my interest and I got involved. And from then on, I just absorbed as much information about the industry as I could and kept going when I graduated college. I was looking for work. I got a, my first job was at WGN radio and I was, a. you're going to all be kind of sad that I had this and you didn't. Uh, I was a radio lover. I got to listen to the radio and write down the time the commercials ran. Oh, wow. nice. My, yeah, I know it's exciting, but <laughs> what it did was get my foot in the door. And then I progressed from there into the film department and then into production where I started as an AD and, uh, worked my way up. Nice. So I've, I've directed over 10,000 hours of TV. Wow, that, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Javier Pacheco. Good morning, everybody. Um, Javier Pacheco, I was born and raised in the south side of Chicago. Uh, first uh, generation uh, Mexican-American, my parents from Mexico, Zacatecas. Uh, 
I was born here. Um, let's see. Uh, as a kid, I grew up uh, playing outside, hanging out. I always wanted to be kind of a musician type, you know, playing with music. I was in bands like growing up, learning to be a roadie. I did all a bunch of stuff growing up. Uh, wanted to be kind of an engineer or a police officer. Those were my two things. And then uh, towards my senior year, I decided to go to Columbia College. I majored in audio. Uh, so I do was like sound recording and music. And my last year I took uh, TV 101 and I fell in love with television. So um, from that point, I was able to land an internship at Univision in Chicago for a summer where I got a taste of the production and kind of loved it from there. So I, I was able to graduate in 97 and I got a part-time job at Univision. It lasted about six months before I became full-time. So I was their audio operator for about a year and I TD did a bunch of production and then the opportunity to direct came in and kind of been doing that for about 22 years now directing. So my last 17 were at Aero Art Mundo now, which I love and kind of, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of, I love kind of leading people and kind of seeing things shape and mold and grow and, and kind of encompassing everything and kind of seeing how it, how it flows. So I kind of go from there. Got it. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. And then do we have Kevin? We don't, right? Not yet. I'm hey, I'm here. Sorry, I'm late. My uh, oh, Sun Talk game ran a, uh, a touch long. <laughs> no, so thank I'm you. here. Hi. So I don't know if you heard the question. But the question was just um, where you're from and if you've always had production involved in your uh, childhood, like you always knew you wanted to be in it or was it a route that you made yourself some somehow made yourself to TV? Uh, perfect. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, uh, Kevin Dussold. Um, I, uh, I'm from the north side of uh, Chicago, so I've uh, been, been around here for, for a long time. I went to school out to uh, Cal State Fullerton, where, uh, yeah, I wanted to get into some aspect of TV, film, radio, really, really had no, no, no set direction when I first started. Um, I landed a, a sports internship with uh, KCAL out in Los Angeles, uh, kind of just logging games. Uh, it's pretty cool. I got to go to a couple of Laker games, see, uh, see Kobe Bryant play. Uh, first interview I ever did was with Kobe Bryant. So uh, that, as soon as that happened, I, I, I was kind of hooked into the, uh, into the world of sports television. So when I graduated, uh, I came back to Chicago. Um, I got an internship with uh, WGN in their, in their little uh, sports department. Uh, once again, just logging games, just learning from producers, directors, talent, um, and then uh, you know, just through through contacts and uh, hard work, I landed my first job over at Big Ten Network um, in two thousand and nine. I spent uh, ten years there. Started as a production assistant, evolved to a associate producer. Um, and then uh, about eight years in, uh, you know, I kind of realized I didn't want to produce. Um, I kind of wanted uh, more of the, the, the front bench role and uh, to kind of direct. So, so I shadowed uh, a great director, Mike Newsham. Uh, I'm sure some of you guys might know him. Uh, he kind of took me under his wing um, for a little bit. Um, and then just so happens Big Ten decided to change to automation. So, you know, I kind of picked Mike's uh, brain at the right time. Um, and when automation was introduced, I, uh, I threw my hat, my, uh, my name in the hat, and uh, I was able to land what they call a piloting job, which is, is uh, for lack of a better term, it's directing. Um, so I worked with Ross Overdrive for, for a couple of years. Um, uh, and uh, what was cool is that we also did a, a Big Ten tailgate on Saturdays, which we still used automation, but um, kind of were able to, if you want to call it like old school directing, just regular old directing. Uh, so they asked me to do that. So I did that for, for two years. And then, um, uh, you know, I heard rumors of the Marquis Sports Network and the Chicago Cubs starting launching their own network. Um, and, uh, you know, on the job, came up i applied uh met with the, the crew over there and uh here i am so uh it's been uh it's been a lot of hard work a little bit of luck and uh happy to be where i'm at <laughs> i think that's exactly how i describe my career uh it's a lot of hard work and definitely a little bit of luck and blessings along the way i personally am from Waukegan, illinois 
Um, I was born and raised there. I always wanted to be in production, whether it be filmmaking, whether it be directing, making short films at home with my siblings. Uh, but I always knew I wanted to be in production and directing films and, and making short movies and whatnot. But I didn't know the gateway and financially it didn't make sense because coming from a first, gen I'm a first generation uh, American, I guess. And uh, financially it, may it didn't make sense because my parents would always question how the income would come. And I honestly didn't have the answers. Uh, but the one thing that stuck was with my dad because he was the one who always said, just follow what you love and the rest will fall into place. So I went to community college. I did community college for three years uh, to be financially smart. Uh, and there's no shame in, I love uh, community college. But after that, I did uh, transfer out to Columbia College for my senior year to do all my senior projects because it was getting hard. Uh, after that, once I graduated, I needed to pay my bills. So I applied everywhere and anywhere that like I was based in production. And thankfully, uh, Univision Chicago, Alexander Bench gave me my break in the door. Uh, but I am naturally an introvert and I feel like this job requires you to be more extroverted, which along the way, it made me become more extroverted. So all the intro or ex no, all the introverts out there, it's possible. We can, we can do this job and get the job done. Uh, but along the way, I met a lot of great mentors, including Berta Serrano, and uh, Stevan uh, Petkovic, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, I've been that I was at Univision for seven years, and now I'm currently at NBC5 Telemundo Chicago, where now I have a new mentor, which is Javier Pacheco, and I plan to learn and um, grow and evolve as a director in, in that new area. But you touched a great point, uh, Kevin, and that was automation. I didn't know the difference of before because it only when I came in, automation was already in place and that's all I knew. So if is there anybody who can briefly touch on what it was to work with a whole crew before and then we'll transition into what it is now? Well, uh, I started, WGN has only had automation for about three years. Okay. So we had been working with complete crews uh, for a long time. It's just a little bit more involved. Instead of coding cameras, you actually had to talk to people. And one of the things I see with automation is that directors are losing the ability to actually voice their what they want to do. If it's not coded, sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, we sort of have a hybrid automation because we do have an audio operator. We have uh, our cameras Although they, they're automated, we still have a robotic camera operator. And on the shows I work with, I either have a jib and steady cam operator as well. But beforehand, you had to tell people what you want to do when you want to do it. Um, in the old days, when I first started, we were rolling film for news. So film was an interesting animal because you had audio on one film chain and video on the other film chain. So you had to have a three second pre-roll. So you're simul rolling the two film chains three seconds before you wanted to take it. On a VO, it wasn't as critical, but on a sound bite, it absolutely had to be critical. And because the, the sound was intermingled, uh, we would do a live dissolve if you went from a VO to a sound bite, it would all be on one reel. So you really had to time it. I think one of the things automation has taken away from directing is timing, uh, learning how, think, how to time things, how to time your roles, because you don't have to do it anymore. It's now roll take. It, you don't have to do it. it. You take it, it rolls. Uh, I was doing some sports for a while and doing news. And when I would go out into the sports world, you'd almost forget that you had to roll the clip because mm -hmm. there you have a full crew. When you're in a uh, newsroom, it's a, it's you you roll you take it and it rolls. So that's that's a big thing. Um, it it was interesting. I'm saying it's a lot easier now to do news, but it was a lot more fun back then because you were able to interact with people. Mm. Okay. Anybody like to piggy off of that? Yeah, I too started. Um, 24 years ago and it was a full crew 
Um, so you do miss that interaction with the rest of yeah, the people? Yeah, um, uh, you know, I was about. Everyone. But um, now with automation, you know, it's we're down to two people. So we're fully automated, but yet at the same time, I still have control over robotic cameras and I do audio. So there's a bunch of stuff that you have to take and take into account. <clears throat> And automation is only as good as you put the time into it. Yeah, you're limited on, on on the last minute quick things, but preparation is everything in automation. I mean, you have to prep your show really well as far as the video and even queuing audio dissolves. I mean, a lot of that stuff sometimes gets killed when stories get killed. So you have to remember to where your fades are, where your dissolves are, where your little customs are to do that stuff. So it is changed the game a lot, but we have to adjust to it. And I know it, it's not as as... I miss the people involved with the full production, put it that way, talking, having a full crew. But now with the way things are moving forward, there's no moving backwards. So we have to kind of accommodate what's happening now and, and accept it and kind of just do the best we can with it and roll with the punches. But at the same time, learn how automation can work to your advantage or disadvantage, but how to work around those disadvantages at the same time. And uh, the thing that we used to say is, in the old days, it was 20% preparation and 80% execution. Now it's 80% preparation and 20% execution. Definitely. And, yeah. and that, that is huge. Um, so I think that, that's an important thing to know, to be able to go in and be prepared. And hopefully your producers understand the limitations or what it can do. Automation is wonderful for complex things that would be very difficult for a TD to get to quickly. Hmm. However, some of the simple things, automation doesn't do quite as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and for me, like I know no otherwise, like when I came in, everything was already automated. It was more, what more can we add to the table? Because at first it was just uh, whether you're punching up uh, videos and cameras, but then they tied in adding audio, they tied in adding, uh, affecting your own graphics, which I can see that definitely 80% preparation is key to a successful show because if anything goes wrong beforehand and you don't catch it there is much more of a possibility of having an error on air because everything happens so fast once you're on air and it's and there comes points when i uh what is it called a one-man band team because i literally am doing everything and that's when i definitely rely on preparation uh but there's also like a in my own opinion, a beauty to it because it becomes like you're almost a, what is that word? A conductor, because it becomes a rhythm to whatever that you're doing and the flow. And my, my main thing is to just keep the talent as um, comfortable as possible. Things may be happening crazy behind the scenes, especially when there's breaking news. But if I alter the talent or if I, uh, throw them off then I did not do my own personal job because I feel like that's what we got to do look out for them because they're literally the only ones out there uh putting their faces on the screen but that's just my own experience I never had the blessing or the uh it, I would think it was amazing to have a whole crew to have audio to have like to run this do this do that it's a lot more delegating I believe uh whereas now it's just more internal de delegating and every now and then communicating with your producer, communicating with uh, your TD and communicating with different departments. But it was, it's not as intense as before. The intensity now relies on one person, which is <laughs> crazy, but that's all I know. Um, and with that being said, we've all been uh, directing different shows. And I, uh, I feel like there's different formats for a morning show, for a afternoon show, and for an evening show. And I know, Bertha, you've had experience in directing uh, morning shows, correct? Yes. And, and if you could just give us a little bit of insight of what it is, because you've also done evening. Mm -hmm. So just if you could like compare and contrast a little. Sure. The craziest thing about morning show is waking up. <laughs> because um, when I was doing the mornings, uh, I'm currently at Fox 32 Chicago. I've been there for five years. And the earliest that I had to put my alarm was like at 1.30 in the morning. So once you like actually get past that and the fact that you're going to have to wake up and, you know, make it a consistent part of your schedule and actually go to bed early when the sun is still out. Um, after you get past that, you're OK, like you're up, you're ready to go to work and you head out and, you know, you get there and there's a newsroom full of people that are there as well. So you don't feel too crazy. But um, 
you know, it's like you have to like obviously make sure that your body and your brain are both awake at that time of the morning. Um, and it kind of like works out the same way. I feel like sometimes like people say like, you know, what's going to happen at four in the morning? Well, you'd be surprised how many fires break or like accidents. And it's just, you know, it's the same amount of breaking news as we have, like uh, for the 4 p.m. or the 5, you know, maybe not as many as like press conferences or something, but definitely you're going to have breaking news at that early in the morning. So you have to make sure you know, like your producers are aware, you know, Simon Desk is on top of things. And um, I mean, the biggest difference I would say is, you know, just probably your sleep schedule and like your sleep routine and like actually trying to have a life like, you know, waking up at 1 30 in the morning and kind of working around it that way. Um, but when it comes to the work, like Fox has six hours of morning news and that starts at four in the morning and that ends at 10. And whatever happens between that, um, there's three directors that rotate um, some of them. Well, they pretty much split it up every two hours. Um, and then on the night side, you know, you have a little more time to do things. Um, right now at our station, we have a four, a five and a nine. So then we have two evening directors. We have more time to prep for it. But as we all know, there are a lot of things that do happen in the afternoon. The other day we had to deal with the Jesse Smollett case, you know, the verdict that happened right before the five. It was like, boom, let's go. We're ready. So um, morning news is fun. Um, <laughs> and, you know, as opposed to like night side, um, it's just I, I guess it does depend on who you work with as well. Um, but that's my, those are my, yeah, my two cents. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, sleep is crucial. I had to cover for the morning shift a couple of times. And by the third day, I was like, do I need a nap or do I, <laughs> am I still sleepy or am I good to go? I wasn't quite sure. But once, like you said, once you got up, definitely we were ready to roll. And the adrenaline, I think, takes over. Like once you're in the, in the news uh, or in the director's chair, I just feel like some sort of energy just takes over and you're ready to go. <laughs> uh, but with that being said, Steve and Kevin, you guys have done evening news, no? For most of your career? Well, I did uh, 14 years of the 9 p.m. news on WGN. And then I switched to doing middays and I've done some mornings. Right now I'm doing a lifestyle show called Daytime Chicago. And WGN is on from 4 a.m. to 1 p.m. straight. Uh, so it, it makes for a very busy time. The problem with that is that we wind up, there's no time to do any kind of pre-production mm -hmm. because we're on the air through a single control room and studio. Um, nighttime news, you're reporting about, basically you're reporting about what has happened during the day with the exception of a fire or a, a shooting or, or something like that. Middays and evening news, things are still going on. So you're gonna be taking more live press conferences. Morning news, well, at least the WGN morning news is a lot more, there is news, but they put in some fun and some other things. So it's a whole different, uh, it's a whole different feel. Directing is directing, but the morning news is more spontaneous. The lifestyle show I do is more spontaneous. Uh, an afternoon and evening news are scripted, but you still have to have the flexibility to break out to do things. Um, if you're, there could be last minute interviews, there could be whatever. Uh, I used to do all the election coverage and we would be on from seven at night till midnight and I would do that straight. Um, and we'd have five or six guests, 13, 14, 15 remotes. So that was a real juggling act. I enjoyed that because it was just controlled chaos and kind of like that. And then uh, I also worked at News Nation, uh, the next star 24, soon to be 24 hour news channel. I worked with them at the beginning, um, was there for a year with a couple of other talented directors. Uh, you alluded to Steven Petkovic, he's there now. Uh, and now he moved, he was doing nights, now he's doing mornings. Um, and Dan Fields and Claire Murphy were some of the starting directors and we got that off the ground, did that for a year and then I came back be to the local side. Oh, that's awesome. And then Javier, what's your experience in the evening news? Um, I've been working uh, 
the same shift evening started off doing just the five and the 10 PM news my whole career. That's pretty much. So I, my, I have a great schedule. I mean, uh, off mornings and come in for the later shows and was able to see my kids all morning. And then when they're older, it kind of changes a little bit, but I pretty much, I now direct the four thirty five and the 10. Um, so between the hour in the afternoon, you know, anything's possible that can happen, breaking news. And they're always on standby during the day and the evening comes around. So, um, I never really had much experience with morning shows. Um, I came in once to train in the morning, which is a whole different schedule. I'm, I'm you know, uh, but I, I enjoy, you know, the, the t time now that we have, I think it's really good being the prime shows that we have with the main anchors. So um, that's pretty much my experience with, with shows is just doing that. And I've done also Chicago Marathon for quite a few years now. Uh, we, we put that production along with NBC5 and that's a big, that's a big four hour thing in the morning. We've covered elections, uh, political events, breaking news. My first big job directing when I came to Telemundo was the White Sox parade when they won the championship in 05. So that was great. Never forget that. Um, so, you know, stuff like that's fun. And, you know, I'm always, I'm always waiting for something to break, something to happen, because that's kind of, I, 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 live, I live by the thrill and I enjoy kind of the breaking news and everything kind of falling apart and you're trying to put it back together and make it as best as you can and make it happen, so. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, Kevin, uh, you direct mostly sports, correct? Uh, and if you don't mind uh, giving us insight on what it is to direct uh, sports and whatnot. Oh uh, yeah, I've never, I've never uh, formally worked for for a news station. It's always been, um, you know, Big Ten or Marquee, where it's uh, obviously sports driven. Uh, it's awesome. Um, you know, typical uh, directing week at Big Ten. Uh, you know, changes, obviously, what you'd see is in being a football. You do a bunch of press conferences Monday, Tuesday uh, in the morning, followed by, you know, some night shows, uh, kind of all leading up to Saturday football, which is just pure chaos. Uh, it's awesome to be around in the office. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not the huge biggest sports fan or college sports fan but just to uh, uh, that atmosphere it's uh it's it's pretty awesome and then uh you know things kind of transition into basketball um you know and that changes i guess not having a consistent schedule each season everything changes so uh it, it's nice but uh steve and javier do you guys is it always is are there specific shows that are automation for you guys or, you know, it's like the four o'clock news automation. You no, know, every, everything, everything we do out of Telemundo is, is uh, fully automated. Yeah. Is uh, it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, ours is, ours is automated as well. They really don't even want the, we have the luxury of, as I direct, I don't have to punch it. So I I've got nice. a TD with me. Uh, I, I actually, our control rooms are pretty full. I've got a, for a lot of shows, there's a director, an AD in the booth, uh, a TD, an audio operator. On the floor, I've got uh, a floor director as well as a steady cam uh, jib. Um, so for us, it's changed. The only thing that we've really lost are the live camera operators, the full-up camera, camera operators. Um, yeah. And Kevin, I had done some freelance work at Big Ten, yeah, so I know what I, I know what you were talking I about. You. Yeah. Uh, so I, it, I it's a whole. The office, uh, yeah, sure. I, I would fill in when nobody else was around, which was yep. uh, which was fine. Um, and it, yeah, it was. It, uh, yeah, I mean, Mike Newsham hired me, and then when automation changed everything, we uh, we both left. Totally. Yeah, it's cool. Um, you know, for, for automation for me, you know, like, like I spent maybe five, six months before automation, kind of just, uh, you know, picking Mike's brain, uh, getting in the director's chair every now and then. Um, you know, so I, I had a little, a little taste of what it was before automation. And then, uh, you know, I spent uh, two and a half years with automation. Um, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it. It definitely, you know, where I'm at now, there's no automation. Um, so I, I appreciate, not that I didn't before, but I, I really appreciate everyone's position from, you know, audio to TD uh, to AD to graphics. Um, 
at Big Ten, we still had camera operators. Um, so, you know, I, I entered a, a whole new world that, you know, I had, I, I dove right in and uh, obviously just went with it, but it was cool. So on Saturdays for college football, we stripped away automation. We still use Ross Overdrive to kind of punch cameras, you know, key graphics, uh, play some tapes, but you know, we, we had, we stripped away automate or audio, you know, we had an audio operator in, uh, just cause of how chaotic, uh, football Saturday could be. Um, and that kind of took me out of the automation directing aspect and put me more into, as we're calling it, the old school directing. So, you know, once a week, um, I was able to get that, that little taste of, uh, of, you know, what I, I sought out to do. Um, you know, and then uh, when I got my job over at, uh, at Marquee, I think like the last three weeks, I was at Big Ten, you know, it was automation, but I was, I was calling stuff out loud, even though obviously I don't need to, just, just to get my brain back in the reps. People are looking at me like I was crazy. And I was like, ready, A, roll A, take it, music. And obviously it's all, I don't need to say any of that, but, uh, you know, it was uh, just kind of getting my brain back into that calling mode. Um, but, um, uh, I enjoyed automation. I enjoy, you know, the way, the way I'm directing now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think how, how you, how you use the system or, or, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of benefits from it. It's obviously uh, a lot of disadvantages, obviously just with, with personnel, but, um, uh, you know, it led me to, to where I am today. So, uh, I, I can't, uh, can't knock on it. Got it. Thank you for that. Great answer. Um, now I'm gonna change the topic a little and I'm gonna, it's time for some representation. And Berta, as a female in this industry, um, I wanna get your insight. I think um, there definitely has been a change. Uh, this happened when this week, like this week, there was a point where I was getting ready to direct the 430 and I was getting uh, walking towards the TD and uh, director's chair. And Miriam, who Javier, you know, was directing. Uh, Wendy was TDing. Uh, both our male anchors called out six. So then uh, Suli and Annabelle were anchoring. And then we had female reporters uh, all around. For some reason, everything just worked out. And I just looked over at Annabelle, which is our anchor. I was like, talk about girl power, because that was amazing to witness. And I don't know if it's like that in every control room or what is your experience along your career is what I'm asking, I guess. I feel like as a woman director, um, you really have to prove yourself. People are not going to trust you off the bat. Um, I started, I don't even see when I was 22. So I was kind of learning my way and learning, you know, how to do everything there. So it does take a while for people to actually trust you and to figure out, okay, she's got it. She knows what she's doing. Like, we're okay. Um, it takes a lot of like personal confidence to sit in a control room, to be a director, to know that, you know, for the most part, like 80% around you are usually male. Um, but, you know, there's really no like, like a negative connotation to like being a female director. It's just like, you have to maybe work a little harder, you know, get through like the bias of, you know, maybe, she's having not a great day or things like that, that might be an issue, um, whatever. But it, it's really about like trusting who you work with, you know, making sure that they understand, like it doesn't matter if you're a male or a female, like you need to get the work done. The job needs to get done. And, you know, have confidence in yourself. Everybody's listening to you when you're directing. It's your voice that they're listening to. So if you're not having a great day, well, you know, suck it up make sure that during that hour nobody knows that you're having a bad day and you know get on with it because you know uh, the show has to go on i'm actually currently six months pregnant so um we're very excited it's our first baby unfortunately my biggest issue as a female right now in the industry is that i do not have any parental leave so that's something that I'm struggling with. I know that it's, it's a completely different issue, but I believe if I was a male director, I wouldn't have to worry about this as much, you know? So this is something that I'm actually dealing with personally right now. And I mean, it's, it's my life. It's just what's real for me at the moment. So 
that's um that's what I'm going through but yeah I love being a female director I feel like uh, you kind of like just I don't know maybe break people's um you know mentality about women like oh you can direct it's like yeah we can do anything that you guys can do there's nothing wrong with it you know so we're trying <laughs> <laughs> no and I think it's definitely a good topic to touch upon even though it's taboo uh but there are differences that uh aren't necessarily applied to people in production and especially women when they are having kids I think you're not the first one one of our other friends also had a hard time finding just time off to recuperate and enjoy the baby at the beginning uh but it's definitely a conversation that needs to be had and continue to be had because it's something that we need to progress to I think the, and this is my own personal opinion, everything has been so formatted to male, 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 that they, now I think the conversation is changing where it's like, well, now we need different things because women can direct and women are directing. So what does that entail with the rest of the uh, agreements that we have or the pay time off, the, all of the uh, things that in, are entailed to that? So, but I applaud you. I honestly, you know, I look up to you. You are one of my mentors and you are amazing and you run that control room like any other male I know. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you for letting, uh, giving us that information. Uh, now, Javier, I'd like to ask you what you think is um, the difference of directing in a Spanish uh, network as opposed to an English network, because I think Having me personally having worked in a Spanish network, there are uh, there's another layer of difficulties on top of the already uh, difficulties that we have. <laughs> sure, um, I I've only been in Spanish numbers my whole career, but it was mostly started in English. You know, I mean, obviously the whole control room speaks in English. The whole crew is comfortable in English, but the on-air product is in Spanish. So to my benefit, uh, my Spanish isn't hundred percent, but it's improved definitely over the years, but I do understand and speak it. So it is a plus to be able to uh, know the language because when they're ad-libbing and they're chit-chatting about stuff and you have to cut away the things you gotta kind of, when it's one of those shows where it kind of flows, you have to be able to listen, especially with sports too, because he's ad-libbing sports. You have to know when the video is coming in, what he's talking about, if he's transitioning to the next story. So being able to understand the language um uh is definitely a plus speaking it you know they all understand english so english is fine but i do speak both of them but definitely uh directing in spanish i've never directed in spanish the language itself it's all directed in english but being able to listen in spanish and understand what's going on uh is definitely a big plus so um i've directed i've tv stuff in, in english before but never directed an english broadcast it's all pretty much uh in spanish got it no, yeah. plus yeah i think when i was at um univision i would joke around with uh my tv2 person i'm like all right i'm gonna direct this whole uh newscast in spanish and it's hard like the first few i'm like wait what stand uh take i, I couldn't do it <laughs> yeah, it's, it's impossible <laughs> but the one hardship for me that i did realize along the years is uh when there is breaking news uh, especially here in like Chicago area, because that's all I know. Uh, but our anchors have to constantly be translating while at the same time listening. If they're doing it, we have to actually be doing it too, because we're listening to the English. Oh, bring it down, lower the volume, or bring bring the Spanish up higher. Okay, they're finished now. You know, so I think that's the added level that I've seen personally, where we have to just reflect and realize, wait a minute, we're doing two multi language basically at the same time and then when they're wrapping up and like you said after that we listen to the cues and go uh off of what they're saying so but yeah thank you very much for that um and now uh i don't know if you guys but i had a moment where i personally considered myself a director and uh where i finally because all this time and i'm still learning i will always continue to learn but one moment in my directing career that i realized that i was a I'm like, man, I can actually do this. And I'm actually pretty good, um, was, which is funny that uh, it was during the uh, Cubs parade when they won. <laughs> when they won the World Series during the Cubs series, it was the first big show that I directed for four hours. And I was the main director. And uh, 
I remember because everything was going wrong that day. Uh, the bus was, uh, the train was delayed. I got there later than I thought. I literally got in the seat. They gave me everything that I needed and I started coding my little heart away. Uh, but once I was done with the show and it came out good, I was like, wow, I am really good at what I do. And, and the hardships that came with it made me appreciate the job so much more. And so I'd like to gain insight on whoever would like to comment on a moment where like they had that eureka, like, oh my God, I, I love this, I'm good at this, and I want to continue to do this. Whoever wants I think to. my uh, moment was when, when I first started at Fox 32 Chicago, um, I was working the morning show and one of the directors called in sick. And I think it was like my third week there. So I was still kind of getting trained and we were so short staffed that I had to direct for three hours straight. So I had been at Univision Chicago and the newscasts there were only about a half hour. So it was like, you know, you did your half hour newscast and bam, you were done. You, then you would do another half hour around 10 and bam, you were done. So at Fox, they were like, hey, we don't have anybody else. Are you able to jump in? Are you able to do this? And I was like, I mean, am I, do I have a choice? Like, yeah, I have to. So let's do this. I don't remember what I put on the air. I was just kind of going through the motions. I was just making sure I was surviving. And it was like, all right, you know, it, you just kind of have to go with the flow, you know, whatever they're throwing at you. It's just like, I think after those three hours, I mean, they somehow flew by. But after those three hours, I realized I was like, okay, I'm a director. Like I'm still learning obviously, but it wasn't terrible. I didn't bomb it. We didn't sit in black for hours. Like I was okay. And I think that's when I realized like, all right, I can do this. I love how different it is every single day. Obviously there was no way of knowing what we're gonna be dealing with and like, you know, what's going on. But that was my moment. So I survived. <laughs> you survived. <laughs> Anybody well, else? Or I'll, I'll the, the first show I ever directed was a total nightmare. Uh, I had been there training for two days and the director called in sick and they said, okay, you're doing this. It's like, pardon me? They said, you're, you're doing it, you, you'll, be, you'll be fine. Well, we were using cart machines for video keys and we had film chains that got switched around everything that could have gone wrong tapes jammed my half hour late night newscast to me seemed like it took seven hours to get through we got through it and i was just shaking my head at the end of the day, i can't do this i came back the next day my td who had been there forever at the time said i never thought you'd come back but i did we got through a second show and then a third show and he said you know what kid you can do this. You got this. That's when I realized when these guys and the people I worked with when I first started were the people who started television. These were people who were there when the station signed on. So once you get the kind of positive reinforcement that, yes, you can do it, I think it feeds upon itself. Um, and what I try and do when I'm directing is give the people I work with that positive reinforcement and know that I tell them the worst thing they can, the worst thing that can ever happen in a show is if they just listen to me and do exactly what I tell them to and nothing more. So you want it to be a collaborative event. You talked about being a conductor. Well, you are a conductor, but you're only a good conductor if your orchestra is, work, is good. So if you can lead them, that's great. If you can pull out of them more than they thought they had in them, and give them the opportunity. Four sets of eyes are much better than one set of eyes. They may see something I would never see and give that to you and make your show that much better. Uh, I did the pool feeds for the six Bulls championships though, uh, out at Grant Park, the Cubs and the White Sox championship uh, rallies out at Grant Park. Other people did the parades, but we, we did the pool for everybody. And you had to count on the camera people, because I'm looking at 12 screens, that's it. They know what's going on. If they see something, I may think I want this, but they've got something that's better, you gotta let them do it. There are directors that say, no, nope, you just do what I tell you. That's when you're gonna get in trouble. So my aha moment is knowing that I'm only as good as my crew. 
-hmm. and you have to you don't have to be a dictator do, to do this job. No, yeah, that's all. I totally agree with that. I mean, um, you have to rely on your crew. And that's another thing that I had to learn to as I was coming into my career. Um, but thank you for that. Uh, on another note, I'd like to discuss the small market versus uh, big market. And I don't know if any of you have experience in small markets that you can speak of or speak to? I'm guessing not. <laughs> well, then we were all very blessed to start off in a big market. Uh, I wasn't aware when I started my career of the difference, but I did uh, become aware of what a small market is. And basically, from what I've gathered, you do a lot more hands-on and you're involved in more aspects of production than just one role, um, which I haven't had an experience, but I think to an extent we've all had some sort of an experience when we begin our careers, trying to uh, doing a little bit of everything. Um, but with that being said, what kind of uh, advice would you have for any student trying to uh, gain their foot in the door at this moment in time? Uh, if I may start, um, I think an internship is definitely key. Uh, I got my career off in an internship, uh, hustling and, and showing the company that you're with, uh, what you can do, what you're willing to do, how you play with others, how you work well, uh, making those you know connections with people, uh, don't burn your bridges, getting involved in it. And once you get that foot in the door and you show them a lot, I was able to do that with Univision and they were impressed by my hustling skills and just working in production and helping them everything. And then they wanted to hire me right off the bat but I needed one more semester to graduate. So I said, you know, I, I appreciate the offer, but I wanted to finish school. So I finished and when I was done, I, I made that call and luckily a spot opened up. So I think definitely being involved uh, in an internship, uh, if you can, uh, helps you get an understanding of what it is to be in it. A little taste of everything, kind of be involved in all the aspects of production and kind of, uh, uh, you know, get your foot wet in there and people can see you can see for yourself if, if you've, that's something you really like. And if you do, you're, you're going to shine well and people will see that and, and you'll leave an impression with them and that'll definitely give you a heads up, a plus on that. And take advantage of the internship. Don't just sit there and look at your phone for eight hours a day. Look, see what they're doing. Ask how you can help without being a pest. Ask how you can, what can I do? Can I sit and watch? Can I pick your brain? The great thing about a college internship is because we're all basically have some degree of ego. We like talking about ourselves. And so as a college student, you can go to professionals and ask them what they do, how they do it, and they're happy to tell you. When they graduate and start to get into the business, now all of a sudden they're competition. And for a lot of people, that's very difficult. You don't necessarily want to give out your secrets to the competition. You're happy to give them out to a student, so as a student, you've got a rare opportunity to learn and get some information. Um, you talked about an internship and I think that's wonderful. I don't know how the other television stations are dealing with internships in the world of COVID. We're not allowing them. Um, and, and that's difficult. Now, I think all of us have to be at our particular television station or, or marquee, a lot of my producers work remotely. Did any of your producers, were any of your producers able to work remotely? And how did that affect, or did it affect the quality of the shows or the way you did your show? Yeah, if, uh, for, if you mind jumping in. For me, uh, so Marquee launched uh, January of 2020, um, which is right when uh, kind of everyone had to to leave work and go back home. So, you know, I didn't even do a single pre or post game for, for, uh, for Marquee until, uh, I think it was like July 24th. So, so we introduced, uh, the mix. So we, I, we were directing at home, producing at home, uh, you know, talking to, uh, our encompass, uh, at home. Um, we, we were producing live television, uh, I'm, I'm in my kid's room right now from, from my, this exact seat. Uh, this is the only quiet spot, uh, in the whole house. Um, so yeah, uh, it was, uh, it was crazy. 
for the first uh, seven months of, uh, of working for Marquee. And then, um, you know, uh, they let a small crew back into to the office. Uh, and it's like that now, um, kind of, you know, I think our editors are still working remotely, but for the, for the most part, uh, you know, the whole studio crew is in the office now. Um, and uh, we allowed some internships back uh, for a little bit, but um, I, I can't, I can't tell if they're, I, I don't know if they're, if they're allowed in the office now or not, but um, yeah, it's, uh, I never thought that I would be directing from my four-year-old bedroom, uh, you know, calling out, screaming to myself, uh, uh, you know, different things. So it was, uh, it's crazy, but uh, you kind of just learn and adapt and, uh, you know, that's, that's the nature of uh, what we do. Just go with the flow. Yeah, no, I mean, that's true. I think uh, COVID definitely changed our workflow, uh, whether we wanted to or not. Uh, it was just something we had to embrace. And thank God, I think technology tied up and kind of came at a perfect time because we could all connect remotely. I think for me at Univision, our producers were working from home. Literally the only the chief editor, the director, and the TD were the only ones in the whole building. And so that changed everything for us. And it was just a game changer. But I think, like you said, as directors, from what I've seen across the years, we just adapt, whether it's going into automation, whether it's working remotely, whether it's, you just have to adapt to what technology is coming. And with that being said, where do you guys see this industry going or uh, in the future, in the long run? I think we've already gone through so much change and COVID made it so much faster, but I, where do you guys see this industry going when it uh, pertains to directing? I uh, I, uh, you know, two years ago, I would have said uh, it's only going to automation, you know, um, but, uh, you know, you know, I work in a place now that 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 has zero automation whatsoever. Um, it's a it's a tough question. I just I think uh, I think a combination of both, you know, some places I think it just works to their advantage financially uh maybe to to keep automation um and then you know other places you know they they want to stick to kind of the way things used to be um yeah i think directing from home uh once again it was never has never crossed my mind until until my producer was like hey uh we're going to be doing a live show from your house um i was like say what uh so you know it's going that direction as well um but uh you know hopefully you know for for students and people coming up uh you know that they can get some experience in both uh you know obviously some people only have only know the world of automation um which would be a tough uh adjustment to you know, the way kind of the things used to be. And, you know, even, even when I had my interview with Marquis, you know, I, I had to sell myself extra hard coming from the world of automation. Um, you know, like, hey, can't, you know, like, can you do it? And, and to me, like automation is directing. It's like directing on steroids. It's, it's, it's so, it's, it's, it's way more difficult in my opinion than, than the seat I'm in now. Um, you know, and uh, until people get in there and kind of see it, you know, maybe they still, they just don't know. But uh, but for you know, like I said, they, they called it piloting at Big Ten, but it, it is it's directing. You are a studio director leading a control room. Um, so it, it's once again, it's, it's a tough question on where things are going. But uh, but uh, you know, I just hope people, if you if you can experience both worlds of automation uh and and the and the the old school way of doing things that i recommend both uh you'll learn a lot and um you know hopefully uh you know hopefully it, it starts uh in my opinion going back to you know the way kind of things are done in marquee where you get that whole crew you know everyone's kind of doing their part and it's you know it's all it's all coming together and it, it's uh it's good to have people around 
it's, it's good to uh, keep people employed and uh, yeah. You, you know, we've been speaking mostly uh, about studio newscasts and studio directing. There's a whole other world of directing out there and Kevin with live sports, you're on the incoming side, but the people out there that are directing baseball and basketball and hockey, none of that's automated. You're dealing with crews, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with unique setups, you're not dealing with anything scripted. And somebody said, well, it's the same, it's just directing. Well, I've done both. I am a passable director for sports, but I'm a good director for the studio stuff. It is a different world, a different mentality. Um, and it's very interesting because if you get out into the sports world, it's one of the few places that's still very misogynistic and women have a much harder time breaking in as directors. Uh, and I, I think that's really sad, but they have to prove themselves even more so than in a studio. You, because, because it's so, such a male dominated industry, but the the takeaway from that is I think you need to have all of the skills. The automation skills are wonderful. And that's, if you're gonna be doing studio directing, that's where 90% of it's gonna be. Even in uh, small markets are doing it because it saves money. We actually have added people with automation, which I don't think was their intent, but they saw the limitations and they didn't want to accept them. So they put in the people necessary to make it work correctly. But in sports, you have full crews and you also have to know how to deal with the crews. So I, I think it's a, a good hybrid skill to be able to do both. Definitely, yeah, I, I have no experience in direct. Well, I have experience in directing sports when it comes to a segment and already there it's a different flow. Uh, but Kevin, is there more, any more insight you can give us on directing on location? Because I'm guessing that's how it works or, or just more insight on what? that world on uh just just studio directing for for sports the opposite of because stu i studio is what we've been talking about but actually in the yeah the uh so yeah so you know we do uh you know last year 162 pre and post game shows uh all centered around the game so you know uh i know the game crew inside and out um you know um it's definitely a, a different beast uh, directing and uh, producing games versus studio, um, you know, but, you know, even for, for marquee, uh, you know, they're in a separate, they're in a truck, obviously we're in a studio for, for big 10, um, you know, our studio control room would be right next door to the Nebraska, Iowa football game taking place. So, you know, if once again, if you have that opportunity, just stand in the back, be a fly on the wall and uh, absorb whatever. And um, I've done it many times. And, uh, you know, it's in my experience, this is a small, a very small world that we work in. So a lot of people that, you know, are working on the game, you know, uh, I work with now. Uh, Kristen Richards, a great TD. Uh, she, she, she TDs games um, over Big Ten. She also does uh, marquee games, baseball games. Uh, she, she's our, our head uh, technical director of marquee. But, uh, you know, I, I've seen I've seen her do uh, studio and games. And, um, yeah, it's it, it, it would be very tough for for I agree with Steve that uh, I, I it's maybe you know, I, I know there was talks maybe about like doing like a Big Ten soccer game with automation, you know, some sort of non-basketball, non-football, non-volleyball, yeah, you know, sport that uh, possibly could be run through automation. I, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, you know, whether it exists somewhere or not, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, for, for a baseball crew to go automation, I, I think, I don't want to say never, but I, I don't see it in, in the, uh, in the short, in the short future. Um, 
but yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely a different beast. The the game crew versus studio crew, um, you know, and and a lot of our people uh, who work in the studio, you know, they'll be asked to sub in for the truck, and vice versa. So we're we're constantly always working with each other, um, and you know what I do once again, just to fly on the wall, I'll, I'll key on the uh, the um, the truck director uh, Mike Fox a lot of the time. So I'll just listen to him. You know, I'll just I'll hear him call the shots, and uh, you know, just to see how a different director does things in a different setting. And uh, you know, even today, I'm still learning and uh, constantly being a fly on the wall to uh, different positions and how things operate. Got it. No, thank you for that. Also, in the world of COVID, live sports production has changed, where you used to have a separate truck for each for the home and visitor. It has gone back, gone to a single truck with uh, maybe one camera for the visiting team. The the uh, report, not the reporters, the talent who used to be at the stadium were sitting in a watching it on TV and doing it like that. That's been a dramatic change. Unfortunately, I don't know how soon it would go back to the old model because I'm thinking it may not be as good a telecast. It may be 90% of what the telecast would have been taking an international feed and just augmenting with a single camera of your own, but it's 50% of the cost. And unfortunately, we're still in a business. It's entertainment, but it's still a business. And I don't know that we're gonna go back to the old standard of two trucks, two complete crews, and I think that's going to change the dynamic of directing. The amount of directors will be cut in half. So it's it's something that becomes even more important to hone your skills in a variety of places. Mm. Well, that is good insight. I, again, I have no experience in that, but it's good to hear about it just to see, to get an idea of where the industry is going in everywhere in this aspect, in this industry. Uh, but to piggy off of, back, off of what... Um, Kevin said, which was to be a fly on the wall, what, what advice would, and I'll open up the floor to whoever wants to answer, uh, what advice would you give to a director already established, already making his way, but to build a longevity of his career, just as you guys have. You guys have had a, a long, successful career, but what would you say is the key to having that? I would, I would uh, say, sorry. I would say, uh, def- sorry, sorry, Kevin, sorry, real quick. I would definitely say, um, uh, love what you do. Don't let the stress get to you. Uh, if you definitely enjoy directing and, and you can uh, do it every day and be happy to go to work and happy to work with others and be positive about it, you'll continue doing that because if you let it get to you and, and people get stressed out sometimes and then you become where it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a chore to direct, it's, it's a bothersome, but if you really appreciate it and you take the time to enjoy it and really mean a lot to you. Uh, my wife hates that I love directing because I'm always at the drop of a dime. I'll go to the show, I go do the newscast. So sometimes I say, it's different. It's not, I don't love you the more than the family I go, but it's just, I love directing. And yes, I, I, I drop stuff to go do it, but you can't compare both. I mean, family and directing, my job is different, but my job is my passion. And I definitely, if, if I live close by, I'd be there every day doing what I had to do. But, you know, I am human, so I do need to time, take time off and do things, but I do miss when I'm not there. I'm on my vacation. I'm sometimes by myself at home directing my kids to do certain things, or I'll use some lingo at work. People are like, what are you talking at home? What are you talking about? I go, never mind. Don't worry about it. So I, I do kind of, it kind of dips into my personal life, but definitely loving it and making it a passion will keep you growing strong with that. I always, uh, I, mean, I always say, uh, copy that at home, which I always say at work, you know, you copy that. So my wife's always like, like what? Like copy what? I'm just like, yeah. uh, just, just, <laughs> just don't worry about it. It's, I just, it, it's, you know, just flows out of my mouth. It's funny. And it, it turns out that if I'm watching news, I'm talking about it and I get a lot of abuse. You're not doing it. The super was late. So what? Or, the, or you'll see something, oh my God, it's like what? Nobody else saw it. 95% of what we stress over, the average person doesn't see. So you have to, yes, it's a job, but 
it's not brain surgery. You know, it's not like if you make a mistake, it's not like you drop the brain. It's okay. We'll get through it. And the best part about doing live when it's done, it's done. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you, uh, Steve. Sorry, go on. Oh, no, you're good. I was just going to say, I agree with what you have all said. I've only been directing for 10 years, so I have a while to go. But um, it's just, you know, I can't even watch a newscast at home with my husband because I'm like, oh, my God, look at that chroma key. Like, it needs to be tweaked. And he's like, what are you talking about? And um, it's just, you know, you love what you do. You want to do it every day. You want to learn and you want to keep learning. And that's the beauty of this job that every day that we get there, it's going to be like a brand new day. We started on a blank slate and we have no idea what's going to happen. So it's just, you know, I think a big part of directing is that you have to love what you do and you have to just appreciate the craziness and the madness. You know, we work holidays, we work weekends, we work nights, we work early shifts, like, I'll be at work tomorrow because we have a, like a Bears post game and I'll be have, you know, I'll be directing at like 10 p.m. until like midnight because that's part of my job. And that's what I have to do. And it's just I love it and I'm crazy for it and I'm OK. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally I think um, again, I here like I've had the least not the least experience, but you guys have a long career and I feel like uh, Kevin hit it like on the nail, like I think being a fly on the wall definitely helps a lot. I, I'm always willing to learn from everybody and anybody. Um, and I think for me personally, that's what uh, has helped me along the way. I'm, I'm always, I consider myself a sponge and whatever I can bring in or learn, I can learn something from you. I can learn something from you. I can learn something from you. And as I'm getting older, I can teach you something. I can teach you something. I can teach you something. And I think that's the beauty of this industry. We get to interact with so many individuals, whether it's the anchor, whether it's the reporter, whether it's um, the meteorologist. I personally think we can learn something from everybody and anybody. So that's my my little two cents. <laughs> uh, but with and with that being said, how uh, whoever wants to answer it, how would you describe that relationship between? uh your anchors and your and the director in the control room whether it's uh especially when there's breaking news i think it's crucial for that relationship to be there uh but if you could just anybody give insight on it i i think you have to make sure that the anchors trust you and know that you're looking out to to make them look the best they can I will sometimes get in an anchor's ear saying, okay, we're coming on camera. And even though I've got a floor director out there, they may be looking down, they may be looking away, or I'll tell them, you know, go to break. Or there was a, there have been times when they're supposed to read a tease and the second piece of video isn't in and I'll just say, stop. So you have to, you get that trust with the anchor, then they're willing to go with what, whatever you're doing. In a breaking news situation, they're ad living for minutes, hours sometimes with no information. You have to give them something to make them look good. I always tell them it's your face out there. It's not mine. I mean, I'm going to make you look as good as I can, but I want you to trust me that I will do that. And once you've got their trust, and it, it becomes a matter of looking out for their best interest, because again, like I say, it's their face out there. Mm. Definitely agree. Uh, having their trust and their respect, and also just being uh, there as a, as a coworker, and then respecting that aspect, letting them know that you're there to uh, have a great product on the air, make them look good, make them sound great. Uh, always make sure you don't take them when they're not ready, you know, kind of things that you want to make sure that they're not going to look bad on the air for. So you always want to be two steps ahead, anticipating something that can go wrong, and trying to make sure it goes right before you do that, but communicating to them in their ear when it's important, not over communicating, because you have to understand, put yourselves in their shoes when they're on the air. If they're on the air talking and you don't want to be chattering too much on the ear, so minimize the chatter, but be very specific about what you want to them. You know, during packages and breaks is when you control, you know, their, their mics are off, so you can talk to them a little more, but let them know that you got their back and to have them trust you and, and, and uh, make the decisions that you need to make the product good and clean on the air, I think it's very important. And they'll see that and they'll definitely be behind you. So you tell them, you know, trust me when I say when to go, when to talk, when your mics are hot. 
and giving them that confidence that, hey, I can I can trust my director. He's going to have my back. He's going to let me know when it's good to talk, when it's not, what's happening next. Sometimes producers uh, might drop the ball or, or tie it up with something else. So I'll take over and I'll let them know what's coming up next, even though it's not my job to do that. Uh, I want to keep the flow going, keep the rhythm going. So if I got to go down the next story, they need to be guided as to what's coming up next. And they'll feel that confidence from you. And they'll definitely appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, communication, trust. I also think being honest with them, like when you make a mistake, apologizing, saying, hey, that was my bad. You know, let's keep going. It's fine. We have a female anchor at work who sometimes likes to take off her shoes. And I always try to give her a heads up. If I'm going to take a cross shot, you know, down the line, I'm going to see your feet. Hey, you got your shoes on? Yeah, okay, good. And she knows that I got her back. I mean, it's her shoes. Somebody at home, I noticed she's sitting there barefoot, you know? So it's like the little things that you like build your, you build your trust with them. It's, I mean, it's a workplace really a relationship and friendship that you, that you end up building with them. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, it's definitely crucial. Um, That's something that I learned early on, uh, having started at a young age. And I think when I came in, people uh, just didn't necessarily think I could do it just because I was so young. And these people had had a long career way way before me and after me. Uh, But gaining their trust is definitely crucial and important. And I think I that's one of the most important things I want to have with my anchors and with my reporters, because the rest will fall into place and people will help you along the way. But if you gain that trust, uh, you will have successful shows in my own personal opinion. (laughs) Um, Well, I just lost my train of thought, but um, let's talk about uh, what quality do you admire about yourself that you think a director uh, needs to possess and it, it just be one. Just for everyone who's trying to be a director coming up and it's like, oh, like my own personal quality right. is I remain calm and during tough situations, as much as crazy as the breaking news gets, as intense as the constant changes is, I personally am very, very calm. And I think that's where my introvertedness helps me because people uh, see me very calm, but I'm just literally going through every plan that I can in my head and my little heart is beating so fast that uh, I don't uh, alter the control room. Yeah, I agree with you. I think uh, calm, uh, you know, confidence, you know, it's where, you know, it's like, you know, everything looks steady up front, but, in, you know, inside it's just, you know, it's chaos. Uh, yeah, confidence, uh, definitely just, uh, you know, Things constantly go wrong. Uh, yeah, just stay calm. Uh, you know, just own the moment. Um, you know, fake it till you make it. Sometimes, um, yeah, just just trust yourself. And uh, you know, when things do go wrong, you know, which which took me a little bit of time to learn is just, you know, move on. You know, you could have like 98% of a good show and then like two, you know, two little things you wish you got back and that's all you harp on for like the rest of the evening. It's just like, yeah, like, why did I cut that camera? You know, why did I take that deal when I shouldn't? But it's just, you know, move past that and, uh, you know, uh, appreciate the other the other 98% of what went right and uh, build off that. So, yeah, confidence, stay calm, cool, collected. Because you know, you know, when when stuff hits the fan, it's you know people are looking at you to to direct them where to go. Um, so uh, even if uh, even if you know mentally things are going a little crazy, just uh, you know just put on a good face and uh, push through. I I had a professor in college who said, "Don't raise your voice when you start shouting. It means you've lost control of the situation." and then your crew will lose, can lose faith in you. So even if you feel like you should be shouting, don't. And I'd love to say that I 100% do that, but there are times when you do have to raise your voice, but you need to let people know you haven't lost control of the situation. I think the confidence and leadership is definitely a plus, uh, being able to command uh, uh, a crew or a crew of two or three, maybe, or even if it's just you and someone else, but you have a whole 
production, you have reporters and anchors, if you can lead them the right way and, and, and have confidence in what you're doing and take command of the ship, sort of speak, uh, everything will fall into place. You know, if they see you uh, taking that active role of something's breaking or something's uh, happening, and you have to kind of last minute make things happen. If you stay calm, cool, and collected and get through it, they're going to see that, that you're able to pull them through that that rough patch and, and they'll definitely uh, have the confidence in you to keep moving forward with that. Yeah, I think just staying positive as well helps. You know, whatever happens, it's like, hey, you're going to hit a commercial break. You're going to just uh, keep going. You know, it happened. If there was a mistake, all right, let's just keep on moving. Just, um, yeah, calm, cool, and collective all the way as well. People ask me, like, do you ever yell? I'm like, yeah, I yell. I yell at home and my husband and my dog. <laughs> but like in the control room, I feel like people will lose, not so much that they'll lose, um, not so much trust it's more like I feel like they respect you more if you talk to them in a professional way no matter what's going on you just you know stay professional and realize that you guys are all coworkers. you don't have to talk down on anyone or anything like that you just want to stay positive again you're the director everyone's hearing your voice if you're breaking down everyone's going to be like hey what the heck is going on like so it's just you know positive and good vibes <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, and with that being said, um, I think a topic that we don't talk about as much is the psychology aspect of it. Um, we, as much as the reporters do, and of course, they, that's a whole other monster of its own, but we get this news on a daily basis. And nine times out of 10, it's not the most uh, good news. Uh, so I think we take on, whether we want to or not, a lot of negativity. So how do you guys go about handling that or brushing it off per se? Many times during a newscast, if it's a really good newscast, I don't know what many of the stories are about. I know I've gone from this video to a, a, a double box to a remote and I did a VO sat out of the remote and came back and they chatted with the anchors or we put video in a box while a press conference was going on. I hate to say I'm not always paying attention. I will get home and my wife will say, well, what happened? I don't know. She said, you just did two hours of news. What do you mean? No, nah, don't know. When I was doing sports, I would come home. Who won? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. The team that scored the most points, I guess. But it's, it's one of those things where if you've done a really good show, a lot of times you don't really know the content because you're so involved in the moment of getting the show done. Yeah, I, I think personally, yeah, I agree with that 100% because uh, people ask me for the news, but I'm like, I'm focusing on banners, two boxes, uh, grommets, none of the actual news. But there definitely had been moments, uh, I remember when we were doing coverage of the Gage Park Massacre, that was intense. So that, after the show, there was just something looming that I couldn't explain. And I, I had to just, for me personally, I took, just dusted it off and went through the motions. But also I remember there was a moment when uh, Mexico had like a big earthquake and a lot of our loved ones were nearby while simultaneously Puerto Rico had a, a uh, major hurricane where a, a lot of other people's uh, loved ones were at stake too. And I, that moment sticks out for me personally because everyone was so worried about contacting their loved ones, whether it was Puerto Rico or whether it was Mexico, um, but we couldn't get a hold of anybody, but it didn't matter because at five o'clock we needed to go on the air and everyone literally put their game face on. And those are like the intense moments that I'm referring to because they do stick out and personally, for me, I've just learned to let it go. Where at the beginning, I kind of held things in and I kind of took them home with me and I, I didn't find the right way of dusting them off. But now, a, a, and it sounds weird, but like a cup of wine, watching, uh, when I get home, I watch like silly cartoons. I watch uh, just the opposite of hard hitting news. And that's my own personal way of dealing with it and even talking about it, I think. For so uh, a lot of the times we're focused on just getting the air on the show that we personally don't get the moment or the time to express how we're feeling. And I guess that's where I'm coming from. If 
any of you could give insight on your coping mechanisms, if there are any, if there aren't, then I, I'll just figure it out. <laughs> well, th there's an adrenaline rush that comes from doing the show. Once that show is over, that's when everything kind of sinks in mm -hmm. and you start thinking about it, you can get yourself crazy. You have to really, I try and put myself as a detached observer to the news. When I go and look at it objectively, it can scare the poop out of you because you look back and see what was going on when we were doing the, uh, the riots, the Black Lives Matter riots. You're so in involved in this and watching and I'm telling the reporter, get out of there. It's a great time. No, no, I don't want you chasing down somebody who's throwing bottles. Yeah, it's a great shot, but you have to look out for your safety. And I think we need to be first and foremost, making sure the people that we deal with are safe and you put them in a bad position in trying to get the news that they're, they're putting themselves in harm's way. And that ultimately puts us in a bad position. We want to get the news. We want to do it right. But you don't want to get anybody hurt, which is one of the great things about what Kevin does. Really, the ball game, eh, not so much. Some people may think it's the end of the world, but it's a ball game. Yeah, I think uh, I'm seeing this post, somebody, Adrian said, directing protest coverage last year was a lot, but it's part of being a part of an important industry and an important time to have the news. Uh, we we ended up leaning a lot on each other for help. Take mental health days, do what you need to do to protect yourself. And I think that is definitely crucial, especially at the beginning uh, when we were start, when I was starting out, I felt like I needed to work, work to prove myself to do different things, different do overtime and all of that. But I think taking mental days has become such a, an important thing in my own career. And thank you, Adrian, for sharing that because it is true. And we do lean on each other. I think uh, I find myself venting with other people. I don't know if you guys do in your own control rooms or your own news stations. We, we do, uh, I try to work with, especially some of the younger directors to make them realize that this is, it's a, it's a great job, but it's still a job. And if it affects you, it affects your health, step back from it. I don't say leave it, I say step back from it, put it in the proper perspective of work-life balance. You don't want this to be all consuming to your life because in the end, nobody's on their deathbed said, boy, if I'd only worked another hour a day, my life would have been complete. No, no, you want to be able to enjoy, you want your work to be able to give you the, the ability to enjoy your life. Your life, your work should not be your life. So it's 1230 and we want to be respectful of people's time and we do have some questions from the viewers so we probably should address some of those questions right now um i'm gonna uh, jose I'll, I'll i'll read off a couple if that's okay um, we have uh from maria in northwest indiana for the panel my nephew's interested in pursuing a career in tv he'd like to be a director he's a senior in high school um and would like to have resources internship opportunities mentorship opportunities to get started um, what advice do you have for this woman about uh, her high school aged senior um, son who wants to get into the business as a director? Hey, Maria, I actually live in Northwest Indiana. So hello, welcome. Um, I guess my best advice for your nephew would be to, or your son, I'm sorry, I forgot what it was. Um, just to, obviously he's only a high school senior. So if he already knows that he wants to be in TV production, make sure that he picks a college that's going to be adequate for that career choice. Um, once he's in college, uh, like we've all been saying, make sure you get internships, make sure you, you're able to just I mean, in my personal situation, I went into an interview not even knowing what an assignment desk was because I had done writing um, throughout my college career. 
And I was not afraid to say no. I just kept saying, yes, I want to learn. Show me. I can do it. I'll prove it to you. And I think it's uh, a lot of personal, uh, your personal choice just to keep saying yes and, you know, not being afraid to reach out to people. I mean, nowadays you'll find people on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, find the anchors, you know, that work at different stations. Hey, would you be able to help me out? Can I get involved at that media station? What can I do? Um, there's always people that are willing to help at, at all TV stations. So good luck. We had a question from Kenneth Hayes, again, for the panel. Um, do you feel that the traditional format of a news anchor behind the desk is going by the wayside? I've seen news shows in which anchors are standing in front of a green screen or a couch doing news. How do you feel about this new style of directing with anchors who aren't behind an anchor desk? It seems to me we're doing a lot of things because we can. We have multi-screen monitors. When I was directing for News Nation, we had this thing called the six pack, six huge vertical monitors that could move and form one big monitor. You put multiple images in. A lot of times we were putting people there and I said, you're doing it, why? Because you can. If there's a purpose behind putting someone at a monitor, putting someone at a green screen, I've seen you see it a lot, to, a lot of times on CNN or on the Weather Channel. They're doing uh, a virtual set where they're, they look like they're in the middle of a tidal wave. The tidal wave's coming up as tall as they are. I think the real key is to inform the viewer. I don't know that the viewer at home is going to turn your channel on or off because of that. 95% of what we do, we seem to do for us, and we do it because we can not necessarily because we should. I don't, maybe I'm really old school, but I don't know that that's a big plus in the way you present the news. Yeah, uh, for, for me. Go to Kevin. Sorry, go on. No, go to Kevin, after you. Uh, just real quick, for me, you know, I'm specifically focused on uh, 162 pre and post game shows. So, you know, it could get pretty, uh, a lot of rinse and repeat when I see our, our host and talent sitting at uh, our anchor desk for, you know, 30, 30 pregame straight. So I, I am in a position where I'm constantly trying to change it up. Um, you know, I try and get out ahead of it before my boss comes to me saying, hey, why don't you change things up? So, uh, you know, my job and show specifically, um, yeah, uh, we do five, six blocks. Uh, I'll try and move them around to uh, four or five different positions, uh, you know, when I can and, um, you know, do that for a little bit and then uh, head back to the desk for a couple of shows. But uh, yeah, constantly in my position, uh, trying to always think about what's next and how I could uh, kind of spice things up, so to speak. Yeah, I definitely think uh, the anchors look great behind the desk. They're anchoring the shows. But like like uh, Steve mentioned, uh, Stephen mentioned, um, they're gonna do what they want to do. The news uh, department moving them around, the kind of whatever seems to be the latest thing, you know, on a virtual set and a chroma key, a six monitors behind them. You know, depending what's in there, if it's gonna impact the story and, and be part of the story, I think it works great. If it's just to put them there for sake of putting them there, and you're asking the anchors to move around uh, a lot, uh, I need to concentrate on delivering the stories and giving the people you know, the, the, the stories and let them trust the anchor and what they're telling them. So it kind of comes and goes, I've seen it all. So it depends what's happening for the moment. The news department will kind of cater to what's happening and you kind of have to flow with it. So I do see them still anchoring from desk, but also see them moving around a lot, depending on what the time calls for, so. And, and Kevin, the, the thing that, I agree with what you said, that we get really bored doing, you do 30 pre and post game or 130 pre and post games but the view you, your viewer isn't watching all of your shows so for them it may not you may have done 10 of them exactly the same way but your viewer may have only seen one for them it's all new so it by the time we get bored with someone something someone is just getting used to it so i think it's a it's a delicate balance between looking good and 
keeping your anchors happy. Sometimes the anchors do want to move. They want to be out in different places, but it has to be done for a reason. All right, we have two more questions and I'll toss it back to you, Jose, to uh, wrap things up. Um, one from Adrienne um, Pearson at WREX in Rockford. Um, and her question is about uh, the, all the different times that uh, directors have have to report to uh, work. Um, we, I feel like in this industry, you have the option of two very wacky shifts, either midnight to 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. to whatever the ending time is, 10.30, 30. What's the hardest part among directors of adjusting to such socially taxing hours? Well, I, I've worked all of the hours and it's really difficult um, because the rest of your life doesn't work 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. And to be able to go and see people and deal with the rest of your life, that to me has always been the hardest part. I was doing the nine o'clock news when my kids were little. So what we did was adapt. We, I would take them to school, see them in the morning. But by the time they came home, I was at work. By the time I came home from work, they were asleep. So that made it difficult. Um, also, when you come home at 11 o'clock at night, you're still wired and your spouse or significant other may not be. They may want to go to bed and you're still up and about so it creates a certain there could be some tension also on the weekends i wouldn't disrupt their schedule that would be hard if you work mornings just the opposite you're getting up when everybody's still asleep and you need to be aware of that and you're finishing up work and there's really nobody to play with at that point everybody is working or if you're working weekends and holidays I still, after all these years, when I, my wife goes to a, an event, where's Steve? He's at work, but it's Thanksgiving. So do you watch TV on Thanksgiving? Yeah, don't you think someone's there? You watch TV on Christmas? But why? It's like, because you wanna watch TV. We don't turn it off. So I think, I think that's the hardest part of, of adapting is making sure you're able to adapt the rest of your life with the hours. You can get used to any hours if you do it long enough, but you have to adapt the rest of your life to it. And then one final question, uh, Jose, I'll toss it back to you. Um, this is from Raza who wants to know, how has the industry changed for the better and for the worst, specifically for directors. I know some places have obviously combined roles, especially in smaller markets where directors are also their own TDs. So the question would be, how, is it the, how's it change? It's a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a very sort of general question, but an interesting one. How has it changed? Has it changed for the better or has it changed for the worse in the past 10, 15 years? It's changed for the worse as far as uh, we've lost uh, jobs due to automation uh, and the advancement of technology. So that's the worst part about it, I would say. Um, if uh, I guess the worst part is too, you're taking on more roles and duties as a director. If you're comboing, you're pretty much doing everything on your own. Automation is there to run the program, but you still got to uh, assist and direct yourself. You got to uh, floor direct yourself. You got to move promptly. That's automated. You have to cue the talent. So there's a lot of things that, that are involved with the combo positions. Uh, if you're someone who can adapt and kind of take that in and under your arms and learn with it and grow and, and kind of uh, help help you with yourself do it, it, it becomes, you know, a, a new job. You're creating a new kind of way of doing things. But I think that's kind of the future. We, whenever we move forward, companies never go back. So you're never going to get those jobs we lost unless you're doing non-automated shows, but with automation, it, the technology keeps advancing. And, and unfortunately, you know, uh, that means jobs being cut because that's doing more with less people, but we have to adapt ourselves and be able to grow and maintain our positions and, and keep that moving forward, I would say. I think it's also important to acknowledge how technology has changed everything and how it's gonna keep changing everything. 
And if you think, I'm pretty sure if you look at the numbers of like 10 years ago of how many people tune into a newscast versus now, how many people tune into a newscast, it's so different. It's people are gathering their news through a website, through their phones, or people don't even like to watch the news sometimes. So I think that's a big part of it as well. Just remembering like, hey, who's watching and, you know, making sure that you're actually catering to them, um, making sure that, you know, you don't lose your audience. And also, oh, go, ahead. Go, go ahead. I was just going to say to piggy off of that, to recognize who your new audience is, because I think uh, people are growing up and they're becoming adults. And I think people are taking in their news different. I remember at Univision, we started doing Facebook lives. We started doing uh Instagram lives and it was a whole new concept that there, there are two sides to it. I think uh, we end up not giving the best quality when we go off of Facebook live and uh, Instagram and all of that. But to as me as a viewer, the quality sometimes it doesn't matter. But as a director, it matters to me, like the quality aspect of it. But if I'm taking in news, it, I can just literally be on the bus and scroll and scroll. Okay, I got my news. Next thing on the list, you know, but incorporating that new audience and what it means for our industry as directors, whether whether it's running a Facebook Live panel, a Zoom panel that we have going on, it's more accessible, but also I would want not the quality of it to be lost along the way. Well, the, the thing is back in the old days, people said newspapers were dying because why would you wait till tomorrow to get your news when you can watch it at 10 o'clock at night? Mm. Now people are saying, why do I want to wait till 10 o'clock or four o'clock when I can go on my computer, on my phone, anywhere and get just the stories I want when I want them? People still want news. It's the delivery method that's changing. And I think that's what we as directors have to adapt. You need to direct a show differently if you know it's going to Facebook or if you know it's going to a gas station TV or, or a TV in a, in a hotel or, or in, in, a, in a supermarket, they're, you're attracting different audiences. The attention span is certainly shorter. The long form is harder to keep viable. So if you're doing more long form things, you need to you need to make it consistently interesting. I really think the lack of attention span has changed the way we do our jobs. But television as an art form and news as an art form is still viable. It's just the delivery method that's really changing the way we do our jobs. Great. I, I don't think we have any other questions. So, Jose, if you um, wanted to continue with what uh, the panel discussion were uh, uh, advertised to run until one o'clock today. Okay. Yeah, I mean, picking off of that, I guess another question I would have is how do you guys incorporate uh, the social media aspect, the LinkedIn aspect. I mean, we have resumes that are readily available online now, whereas before you had to submit. And nowadays it's just, oh, here's my link, follow me, blah, blah, blah. Do you guys use that to your advantage and how so? I'm actually really bad with keeping up with all my stuff. <laughs> so it's like, if it's coming up and I'm gonna need it, I'll update it, but otherwise, it's not really there. Same here. I don't. I don't do any social media work related stuff. I mean, it's all, you know. If I can, I'll do it for my own personal stuff. You know, uh, I think that's a whole different department on its own. As far as you know, the directing part of it, you know, uh, I might link maybe a story that they want to promote. But other than that, I don't really do much as far as uh, uh, those social media aspects go. Got it. Yeah, because I mean, for me personally, I discovered. Uh, the beauty of social media. Uh, at the beginning, I was using it more for my own personal uh, use, but now as I've gotten older, I've realized how much the younger generation actually uses it. And uh, the hashtags to me have become so important. And I think uh, always hashtag representation matters because we do need more diversity in control rooms. And uh, I hashtag Latino because I want the little kid in uh, Waukegan, Illinois, to know that they too can be a part of this. And so to me, I incorporate the social media aspect, even if it's just a quick picture to, to showcase behind the scenes. I've gotten um, 
messages from other people or younger kids uh, g gaining insight or wanting insight on what it is to be a director. And I'm always an open book. Like I said, I'm willing to answer any DM, any uh, messenger uh, me message. Uh, so I think that's for me how I've incorporated and used it as a walking resume. Uh, and more than anything, just to inspire uh, that next generation that they are very much on social media and, and whatnot. Um, but that's how I incorporate it. Uh, anybody else, if they do, on um, you guys that have had longevity in this career, do you not? I think you're on mute, Stephen. Social media is a double-edged sword. Um, I I know it's important, and when they talk, oh, we had a great Facebook Live, a hundred people saw it. Okay, if you had a newscast with 100 people watching, they, they seem to put an inordinate amount of, um, of importance on social media. I know we need it. And depending on who is watching or who we want to watch our shows, that's where social media is. People, you say, you know, you're looking out for the, the next generation. Well, Jose, you are the next generation to me. Wow. So it's interesting to hear your take on it as opposed to somebody who started in the business before there was social media. Um, it's important, but it I don't think it's the be all and end all, which is why I'm not a web person, I guess. No, yeah, I think uh, when it comes to what I do, it definitely has no say in like what I do as a director, social media is behind it. But when it comes to, and the way I use it is again, to reach, make that outreach to that next generation. Cause I know they're tuning in and they're hashtagging and following and look, giving the likes and whatnot, but it's more about wanting to see who I wanted to be, to see as a kid, if that makes sense. And with that being said, what advice would you give your younger self knowing now what you've done and what you've overcome and where you're at, what would you tell uh, your younger self? Uh, Javier, we can start with you. Ooh, um, not sure, it's a good question. Um, just, uh, I don't know, it's a good question. Just basically, um, you know, uh, maybe if I would have took television a little sooner, uh, but I think I think where that the taste of it you know, it uh, was awe. I think, I think just being more maybe tech savvy in the beginning. I mean, we, we learned as we grow along, but um, knowing that the future would have been computers and automation, I think being, being more computer savvy as I was younger would definitely give you a plus uh, in the future because that's where everything was being, was going towards. So you would have that insight as far as, you know, behind, you know, what, what the computer programming and functions of all that would be. That's a, that's a I would say probably. Uh, Kevin? Um, you know, I've only, I've really only, you know, social media has been, uh, it's been around since I started this. So, um, uh, yeah, it's definitely important in the world of sports, uh, when players or reporters tweet stuff out or, uh, you know, get, get news out faster, you know, we take that in and we'll roll with it during, uh, our production. Um, so, uh. Yeah, I, you know, I've only been around with social media. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely important uh, in what I do dealing with, uh, you know, baseball players. Uh, not only that, you know, even Big Ten, um, you know, uh, it was 14 teams at the time. I mean, a ton of people send stuff out there that, uh, you know, my boss will roll in the control room with back in the day. Be like, hey, did you see this tweet from Urban Meyer? Uh, you know, he just got suspended. Like that's, that's where we got our news from. Uh, and that's how we roll with it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's important. Uh, and, uh, it's for sure not going anywhere anytime soon. I mean, it's only, it's only getting more and more. And then what, what advice would you give your younger self? Uh, just in terms of the job, uh, um, uh, just be, you know, I, I pretty much was kind of a sponge and took it all in, uh, just 
just uh, keep your, you know, your eyes on the prize and uh, there's definitely hardships uh, that you're going to go through, but um, you know, just, uh, just have confidence in what you do. Um, and uh, you know, definitely learn not only your position, but uh, you know, every position around you, you know, I, 10 years ago, you know, 12 years ago when I started, I wanted to be a producer. You know, that's what I thought. Um, you know, I came in cutting highlights, logging games. You know, I kind of only know the world of uh, of APs and producers, uh, and line producers, and all that. And uh, you know, it, finally, it wasn't a fit for me, and I went in a different direction. So, um, you, you know, you could start out as one thing, and I guess uh, I ended up where I am because I just, you know, was picking everyone's brain in every position. Uh, even sales, you know, or marketing, you know, it doesn't just have to be focused on uh, on production itself. So, you know, if there's somebody in the office, uh, you know, and they're willing to talk to you, just say what's up and, uh, you know, learn what you can. And, uh, you know, eventually it'll, it'll come back to, to you and your position and like, hey, I talked to Joe in marketing, like he was saying, uh, you know, you know, he, he wants more of this banner up or something like that, you know, just, just, uh, just, just, just uh, be out there and, and talk to people and uh, make those connections. I think I would probably tell my uh, younger self to not forget to have fun. Um, I think sometimes we forget how cool of a job we have. Um, I realized that when I talk to like a new dentist that I go to, and I'm like sitting there, I'm like, yeah, I'm a director for a new station. And they're like, what? Like, that sounds so awesome. Like, what a cool job. And I think sometimes we just forget, like, how lucky we are to have these positions. And, you know, just they're cool jobs. And, you know, don't take yourself so seriously. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn along the way. Have fun. You know, make really good relationships with your coworkers. You never know when you're going to need them later on. And, yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> Nice. And then Stephen? Well, I think you should listen more than you talk. Absorb from people around you. And you should do your job and have fun at it. And when it stops being fun, that's when you need to reevaluate. But I've been doing it a long time. It's still fun. So keep going. Awesome. Good to hear. Um, my, my own advice to myself would be uh, allow yourself to make mistakes, which is going to be the segue to my next question. Um, when, I, when I was first starting out, I was so scared to make a mistake on the air. I, would, I thought it would be the end of the world. I thought people would think the worst of me. But as I progressed my career, I realized I'm not afraid of the mistakes as long as I learn from the mistakes, as long as we don't repeat the same mistake over and over again, because then it becomes a problem, which takes me to my next question. Um, what is the biggest mistake you guys have done on air? <laughs> I guess the simplest answer would be just uh, punching up black when you were <laughs> in the middle of something. I mean, you know, uh, that would probably be, you know, the biggest, you know, uh, that physically we made, because other, other than, you know, uh, production, you know, uh, wrong misspellings, wrong boxes that go on the air, that's kind of out of our control, unless we can catch them beforehand. But taking black uh, would probably be one of the biggest ones that I would say I probably made, you know, at that point. So if you take black and you're on it, you just roll the brake and just kind of try to get out of it. Or if you want to come back, depending how much you were in black for, so. <laughs> Bertha, do you have any mistakes you'd like to share? Oh, yeah, there's a long list of mistakes. Um, uh, I mean, to think of one, I, I wouldn't say that I've had like the worst mistake ever. I can't really think of it right now. It would just probably be like punching maybe like the wrong camera if we were live with a router. And, you know, I went back to the studio and maybe the anchor was, I don't know, on their phone or fixing their hair, just minor things, you know, nothing too crazy. Obviously, punching black once in a while happens, you know, it just depends on what's going on. But I, I can't really think of like something that stands out right now. That's a good question. Let me think about it. <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, Steve or Kevin, do any of you remember or recall a mistake? 
Well, in, in all these years, I don't think I've ever done a perfect show and I can find a mistake in just about any show. The thing is to hopefully try and look past it and not repeat it. Uh, I know I took a jib shot one time and it looked to be set. And as soon as I took it, the guy said, I've lost all control of it, swung the thing up, almost slammed into a, a, a person. I cut off of it just as the camera went 90 degrees. Uh, other than that, it was a fine show. <laughs> Kevin? No, the only thing that, that comes to my mind uh, is uh, we, we were doing a uh, an obit uh, in, with automation. And, um, you know, I coded uh, the VO uh, to this day. Uh, I definitely coded it with no music, but um, for some reason, uh, embedded deep in there was a, uh, a a nice, strong, hard rock cut. So when I took uh, the obit, uh, just pound and hard rock came in, um, and I just grabbed that fader, chucked it down, uh, and uh, obviously we had to uh, reshoot that. But uh, in the heat of the moment, I was just like, man. That was not good. <laughs> Got it. Now, the reason I wanted to end on that question is just so that everyone knows making mistakes, it's part of the learning process, you know? It's not the end of the world and it's okay to make mistakes, like I said. Uh, but that will conclude my last question. I have no mistakes. I've been mistake free. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, took, I once took a chroma shot uh, before the camera moved. So then our... Um, Meteorologist just popped out of nowhere and was magically at the chroma. <laughs> so I took it too late. I took the chroma too late, uh, but it was magical. Uh, but no, I'd like to end on that note. We make mistakes. I'd like to thank each and every one of you. Berta Serrano, director of Fox, good friend. Kevin Dussault, director of Marquis Sports. Steve Novak, uh, director at WGN. Javier Pacheco, my newest mentor, director at Telemundo Chicago. And actually all of you have become my mentors from now on. And I'd like to thank uh, the Academy for hosting us and Erika Maldonado for, and the board for getting this together. I hope it helped uh, spark interest and spark um, those new directors that are up and coming and the directors that are in place to have a long career in this industry. So with that, I will say thank you. I appreciate your time. Have a good day. And hopefully we run into each other in the future. I'll turn it over to whoever is gonna right. sign. <laughs> and, and thanks to Jose Aguilar for being such a great moderator. We really appreciate it. Wonderful questions. A, a great, great uh, workshop. Hey, Adrian Pearson's on. Before we leave, Adrian, did you have a question um, for the for the panel? I know we have to get off soon, but I you had some great questions in the chat. So I wanted to see since you've been admitted into the panel, if you had anything you wanted to say. Adrian. Definitely not. I guess not, but thank you for thanks. So it's not her. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is Rebecca, by the way. And thank you. Um, I'm with the Academy and, and thank you guys for um doing this panel. It's been awesome and to listen to it and hear your your thoughts and especially the mistakes part was was wonderful to hear because I think everyone makes mistakes in this business, that's for sure. So thank you to everyone. And please let us know, um, any of the attendees, if you have any uh, further questions, um, any comments, uh, please e feel free to email me at chicagoemmy at gmail.com and I'll help you out. You know, we're here at the NATUS office here to help you, our members. So thank you. And if right. anyone's got questions, feel free. Rebecca, I'm sure we'll be able to pass them along. Uh, or if anybody wants to just talk and see get any kind of information, I'd be happy to talk to people. That's great. And then Erica uh, Maldonado and Atia Owusu, they're, they're the uh, uh, workshop committee, uh, uh, co-committee chairs, and they did a great job arranging this. Erica, Atia, do you have anything um, that you'd like to add? 
Thank you so very much, everybody. Great conversation. I, I'm, as you know, I'm besides being the co-chair, I'm an anchor, and so it was definitely interesting hearing your your, your perspective and put um, a, be able to put myself in in your shoes also for for a change and uh, a great advice for people that want to come and work in this industry that we all love and are very passionate about, and that's why we're doing this type of workshop so everybody that can can have a better perspective and we also can have this conversation among our peers which is incredibly important i think to enrich um the you know our our, our craft it doesn't matter if you're behind the cameras if you're in front of the cameras this is this is what we do what we love and, and, and at the end of the day, the product that we put on the air is for the benefit of our communities. And so any way we can improve the quality of the product that we, that we put out there, it, it's beneficial not only for us, but also for the people that we are serving that at the end of the day is our audience. So thank you so very much for participating. Thank you for your questions. They were wonderful. And we hope to see you guys in our future workshops. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for having us. And I should also mention, Erica mentioned future workshops. Sophia and Erica have a, a lot of ambitious workshops planned for um, the upcoming year, including uh, workshops that we're, we're gonna partner with the National Association of Black Journalists, National Association of Hispanic Journalists, and the um, um, Association of Asian American Journalists coming up in the new year. So please uh, look online, chicagoemionline.org for dates and information about those workshops. And thank you so much for attending today. Thank you, John, for hosting us. Yep. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. And Rebecca, great job as always. Thank you. Nice meeting everybody. Thanks. Nice. Thanks. Nice. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye. Oh, and look for it online. This is all archived and it'll be online on the website starting uh, as soon as probably Monday or earlier. So look for we'll the have a recorded version online. Yeah. Right. Thanks, See everybody. Adios. Bye. See you. Take care. All right. Bye. Hi, Erica. I'm here still just in case anything else. Um, um, Rebecca, yeah, everybody said all, all the emails. I was uh, asked them if they, if we receive any question from anybody in the audience, if they feel uh, comfortable for us sending them to their emails. So in case you receive any question for, I don't know, Javier or Kevin or Steve or Bertie, um, you, you can forward them. They give us permission to forward them to their emails okay. without asking them. Okay, so you, you already have that in the bag. All right, sounds good. Thank you. And, and they right. know they might get a couple of questions. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, my dear. I hope everything right. was, was good. Okay. Bye, Connor. Bye, Diego. Bye, Raz. I see you guys are still on. So thank you for joining us. <laughs>